The Undoing. I've been loving the show. I've watched the episodes a few times, but like nothing too crazy. Like I haven't been that obsessed. <laughs> Stop watching this video right now if you aren't caught up, meaning you've watched all the way through episode four. Because yes, there are going to be spoilers in this, duh. Or watch anyway, because we are about to have a great time. Getting right to it, the art in the show is so insanely full of meaning and symbolism. Like it's kind of creepy and I love it. The paintings and sculptures used reveal so much about these characters, potential motives and themes. The art gives us clues about what could be going on. Like I knew there'd probably be a few metaphors in that one huge ass painting that Franklin keeps visiting at the museum, which is true and we'll talk about that, but the sheer volume of eerie parallels between the art and the storyline is kind of insane and like really impressive. I used to be more of a skeptic that most, not all, but most art in movies was just pretty filler art. You know, like that palm tree print that your mom has in the guest bathroom. But that's not the case in The Undoing. I think the art reveals to us a lot of hidden clues. Oh, by the way, hi, I'm Jess. I like to talk about art and pop culture and myself. Jumping into episode one. So about 27 minutes into the episode, we catch a glimpse of this artwork. And this is the scene where Grace runs into Elena in the bathroom. And Elena looks super distraught and it looks like she was just crying and she says that she's overwhelmed and lost. And this artwork in the background is The Kiss by Gustav Klimt. It's a pretty famous painting so you might have seen it before but it shows a man and a woman in an embrace. The man is kissing her and they're just enveloped in this like golden halo of love and passion. Or it's kind of like a golden like cocoon, like a protected space. Or maybe even like a golden bubble. And I chose the word bubble because because in the opening credits of the show, if you remember, there's like a lot of symbolism dealing with bubbles and bubbles bursting. Hmm. The man side is full of sharp edges, geometric shapes, black and white colors. And then you have the woman's side, which is more flowy and organic and soft. The man's face is hidden because he's kissing her. So all we really can focus on is this woman's face. Also, I thought it was like a little like creepy cool that she has red hair herself. You know, I feel like it's a little hard to read her in this painting because she does look very peaceful and serene. Or maybe she's a bit overwhelmed, or maybe she's overwhelmed in a good way by like love and emotion. But also keep in mind, they're on the edge of this cliff. And if I was that close to the edge of a cliff being kissed, I'd be a little sketched out. Like, I don't know if I'd be down to have this like little romantic hookup sesh right on the edge of this cliff. Like. Does this represent the man's fear of losing his lover? Or are these lovers about to lose themselves as they fall in love together? Maybe this foreshadows Jonathan and Grace's relationship, or even Jonathan and Elena's relationship. Who knows? One last artwork that I'll mention from episode one, which I don't think is really that symbolic, but you know, I'll still talk about it for a second, is that David Hockney is brought up a few times. Hockney is a famous English artist. You might recognize this painting by him. I like his work, um, he's really popular in the art market. Like in 2018, one of his paintings sold for $90 million. And the Spencers, you know, the family with that huge ass penthouse apartment where the charity auction was being held for Reardon, um, apparently they owned two Hockneys. And yeah, I think the mention of the Hockney paintings quite a few times by the women on the auction committee and even Jonathan just kind of adds to this idea of all these families are very wealthy and very privileged and Hockney just kind of adds to their status. That was my espresso machine. Sometimes it just goes off whenever it wants to, like it's kind of possessed, but it makes great coffee. Anyway, on to episode two. We get a ton of creepy symbols in this episode. We see Grace go to the Frick collection to visit her father, Franklin. You know, we quickly get this impression that he's kind of old school. He's kind of dark. He's kind of traditional and stoic. He lives in this fancy apartment that looks like it might as well be a museum. So it makes sense to me that he likes to hang out at the Frick collection. You know, he's not at like the Museum of Modern Art. You know, he wants his traditional old masters kind of artwork. So Franklin is sitting there at what seems to be his favorite bench in front of his favorite painting. Like Grace walks in and knows exactly where to find him. Of course, we're noticing this large ass painting that he's sitting in front of, but first, 
we get this close-up shot of a sculpture at around 37 minutes into the episode. This is Nessus and Deanira. In my opinion, I think this sculpture is key. This is in the background shot of them while they're sitting on the bench talking, and then in a later episode, we get an extreme close-up of this sculpture yet again. And so I feel like this is definitely very, very important. And let me tell you why. I'm trying to build suspense like the show, is it working? The story of the statue in a nutshell. So we have Nessus, who is a centaur, which means he is a mythological creature that is half human and half horse. And then we have Deanira, and she is Hercules's wife. And hopefully you know who Hercules is. Um, he is the half mortal, half god, heroic figure. So in the sculpture, we see Nessus carrying off Deanira. And the myth goes, Hercules sees this, you know, Nessus is trying to take away Deanira. And so Hercules comes to the rescue and shoots Nessus with an arrow, a poisoned arrow. And this kills Nessus and saves Deanira, his wife. But while Nessus is lying there on his deathbed, he tells Deanira, take some of my blood and give it to Hercules and he will forever stay faithful to you. And this is important because Hercules was known for being like kind of a player. Like he was seeing other women, he fathered illegitimate children. And so, you know, Deanira, she wants Hercules all to herself. She wants to lock down her man. So of course she's like down with this plan. Like, okay, let me take the centaur blood and it will fix my husband, basically. But Nessus was completely lying to Deanira. Nessus knew that his blood was poisoned and if given to Hercules, it would kill Hercules. So this was his way of getting revenge on Hercules. So long story short, Deanira goes and smears blood on one of Hercules' shirts. Hercules has no idea, puts on the shirt, he burns and dies. And then Deanira Nira, realizing what happened, realized that she listened to the centaur that was lying to her, is just so distraught that she then kills herself. Yeah. Also, what's insane to me is that Daenerys' name literally translates to man destroyer or destroyer of her husband. Also, that like kind of sucks. Imagine if that's what your name literally means. There is something going on with this myth and the storyline. Like, so this myth kind of represented like this idea of inevitable doom. Lovely. You know, I see Hercules as representing Jonathan. Jonathan was a successful doctor who seemed to have somewhat of like a hero, god complex. Like he loved the rush of saving people and the praise and the attention that he got for it. And also, of course, he did have affairs as well and a child with Elena. And then Deanira, I think, could represent Grace in a way. You know, Grace is trying so hard to help, but she doesn't realize that she might be adding poison to Jonathan and lead to his undoing or her own undoing. Like, the more she's digging for answers in this show, the more she might hurt Jonathan and herself. You know, and I think the centaur could represent Franklin. You know, centaurs in mythology and art aren't usually portrayed in the best light. Like, they were said to be wild and untamed and caught between two natures and two different personalities. And I definitely see that in Franklin. Like sometimes he's very sweet and loving to Henry and his daughter, but other times, especially as we see in the later episodes, he gets real dark real fast. And I could see as part of the story that maybe Franklin gives Grace the wrong information, you know, the poison that leads to Jonathan's eventual downfall. We know Franklin didn't like Jonathan from like the very beginning. So it would make sense that Franklin would be down to poison Grace's mind in regards to Jonathan. But yeah, isn't that like a heavy dark myth though? Like I really hope Grace doesn't kill herself like Deanira in the story. Like, oh, but I do think whatever she discovers or like the poison that comes out in the last two episodes will be so devastating to her that she stops trusting pretty much anyone around her. And it might lead to her ultimate undoing. Dum dum dum. I haven't done this much talking since 2019. There are two other sculptures sitting on that same table that I'll talk about really- Fuck, the card's full. There are two other sculptures on that same table, and so I'm gonna talk about them really quickly because they also have a lot of meaning that I think has to do with the storyline. I hope you all remember the Disney classic Hercules, like probably one of the most underrated Disney films and like one of my all-time favorites. I bring that up because one of the sculptures has to deal with Hercules and Hydra. Yes, there's a lot of Hercules going on, so pay attention. Hydra is this mythical, scary monster that has a bunch of different heads, and when you chop off one of the heads, two 
sprout in that same spot. So it's like, you're trying to like get rid of one and then two more pop up and it's like really scary. So in effect, you create more problems for yourself by trying to eliminate them. See where I'm going with this? So as the myth goes, Hercules, you know, he's battling Hydra, he's trying to kill it, but he keeps chopping off the heads, they're growing back, and in the end, Hercules is only able to defeat Hydra with the help of his nephew. So every time he would chop off one of the heads, his nephew would come in and like burn that spot so more heads can't pop up there. So then Hercules finally like kills the monster and then keeps the head, I think, for a bit because the blood from the Hydra is super poisonous. And if you remember back to the previous sculpture I talked about where Hercules killed the centaur with the poisoned arrow, it was poisoned with Hydra blood. So as a recap, the centaur was killed with a poisoned arrow and that poisoned arrow came from Hydra blood. But then Hercules was ultimately killed by that same poisoned blood of the Hydra. And it's just like a circle of doom. <laughs> I see the Hydra representing Elena. Not like her as a person, but like from Jonathan's perspective. You know, she keeps popping up and creating more problems in his life. And she's just kind of like infiltrating. She's spreading all of her heads everywhere. And the more he tries to rid himself of this problem, the more it multiplies, the more she really inserts herself into their lives. If we think of Jonathan as Hercules, you know, he's trying to control the situation. He's trying to like squash all these different problems that keeps popping up. But you know, maybe the problems are getting way too big for him and he needs someone's help to take care of this. Like, does he ask for help in dealing with Elena? Does he ask Franklin? I don't know. But in the end, Hercules is still killed by the blood of Hydra anyway. Like there is no escape in this fate. So the last sculpture on the table, I'm not sure if it's really connected to the storyline, but you know, I'll mention it anyway. You guys let me know. But it's of Triton and Nereid. I think I'm saying that right. Um, it's Triton and his wife, I think. And Triton is the son of Poseidon and he rules the seas. And apparently, you know, he could either calm the waves or create a storm. I don't know, there's a lot. Moving on to the paintings in this scene. So of course, we have the large one which we'll talk about very very soon i promise but we also get a shot of this dude at about 38 minutes in the camera turns and we get this wide shot so that it's very clear that we see this dude in the background of franklin and grace talking this is vincenzo anastagi probably ruining the pronunciation of that name but like what's new anastagi was a knight and he was known for being like a hero during a siege in the 1500s like he was an expert on fortifications and defense i love this little symbolic nugget in this scene because this is when Franklin tells Grace that she needs to protect herself and that she needs to get a lawyer. And so I love the tie in there that you have this guy who's an expert on fortifications and Franklin being like, yo, you need to protect yourself. And then in the same shot, we have this painting on the left. And when I first saw it, I was definitely like very creeped out because you have this large man holding a large tool and he's about to swing down on something with like all of his strength. And considering how Elena was horribly murdered, it was just like, a creepy, eerie symbol right there. This painting is actually called The Forge and it shows Vulcan, who is the Roman god of fire and metalworking. But he has like a lot of like dark mythology about him. Like apparently he was like considered the ugliest god. How sad. And um, his wife, Venus, like didn't want to be with him. Like they were kind of like forced together. And so she also had a ton of different affairs. Yeah, so I don't know what to think. I just thought it was like a little eerie to have that painting in the background looking so like dark and menacing. Who knows? Moving along to episode three. Why am I clapping? Franklin is back at his favorite bench in front of his favorite painting at the Frick Collection. Like the detectives even know exactly where to find him. In this scene, we have Detective Joe Mendoza who starts to talk to Franklin, starts to question him, and even says something like, Grace could be an accomplice. So Franklin is clearly triggered now because he wants to protect his daughter. Then the camera flips so that we see this painting in the background. And it's actually titled, the choice between virtue and vice. Guys, I don't think it's accidental at all that this painting is now very clear in the background. And again, it's of Hercules. Hercules. In this painting, we see Hercules choosing between virtue and vice, who are represented by women. 
of course. Hercules seems to be moving towards virtue, but he's also looking back at vice. So I'm not totally convinced that he's bought into this path of virtue. Like he is tempted by vice behind him. And if we're still going with my theory that Jonathan is Hercules in a way, it makes sense that they're both susceptible to vice. And I'm not saying that vice is only Elena. Like vice could just be in how Jonathan operates. Like he's used to getting his way. He's used to mesmerizing and manipulating. Like I feel like he's gotten away with most things so far. Ow, my butt's asleep. I don't know why I keep sitting on the floor when I have couches, but what's the most fascinating thing about this painting is what it says in the upper left-hand corner. It reads, honor and virtue flourish after death. I mean, I think it says it in Latin, but that's the translation. You know, I see all of this as meaning don't hide secrets. It's gonna come out in the end anyway, or like do good in this life because you will be rewarded in the afterlife. Or I see it from the perspective of Franklin. Like he wants things returned to order. And order to Franklin might mean Jonathan, or Elena removed from Grace's life. So after Elena's death, you know, after their removal, maybe that's when honor and virtue can flourish again, you know, to him. I don't know. And also my research, there's like a hidden map behind one of these that actually leads to the treasure. I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence. We're now at episode four. The moment you've all been waiting for, I'm finally going to talk about that large ass painting that Franklin keeps sitting in front of. This painting is Harbor of Dieppe, Changement de Domicile. It is by J.M.W. Turner, and it is like a highlight of the Frick collection. It shows Dieppe, which is on the northern coast of France, and it's this vibrant fishing port in Normandy. At first glance, we see that as very golden, glowing, and luminescent. The artist, Turner, primed his canvases so that when he used these aggressive bright chrome yellows, they were extra bright and shocking to the viewer. And critics hated it at the time. Like they said it was like way too yellow and bright and that it didn't fit the true climate of Northern France and that this color scheme belonged somewhere in like Italy. And then another critic said that his work almost looked like blobs. Turner did have this way of painting that was almost abstract where like parts of the work would be like really sharp edged and clear and detailed, but then other parts were very blurred, hazy, and dreamlike. So he took detailed sketches of this fishing port on like two different occasions. So for this painting, you know, Turner is drawing from his own notes, but he's also drawing from like his own memory and imagination a bit. And this was like another thing that critics didn't like. They said that he like, he didn't paint the port realistically, that he painted it in a very nostalgic type of way. You know, that Turner was longing for what it once was. He didn't take into account all of the new tourism and industrialization and changes that were happening in the port. He still painted it as this like cute, happy, quaint fishing port. Turner just painted it how he wanted to see it, which was probably a bit more idealized. Um, the vanishing point of this painting is the church, which is this little like hazy dome. You could say it's like a symbol of goodness. And then what I find interesting is the name itself, Changement du Domicile. Oh my God, I am so sorry. But that literally translates to change of address. And I think that's just like an interesting parallel to what's going on in the story because Grace and her son Henry is staying with Franklin right now. I actually see a lot of similarities between Franklin and Turner, the artist of this work. You know, Turner was known for being really reclusive and secretive and eccentric. He didn't really have any friends or family. Like his only companion was his dad. Never married. Um, He did have two kids with his housekeeper, I believe, but like, other than that, he was just like kind of a loner. And it also seems like his personality type was all about making like short-term impulsive decisions. You know, he often used pigments in his artworks that he knew wouldn't last long, but he liked the way that they looked when they were freshly applied. And so he valued that over like the longevity of his works. And it also seems clear that Turner liked the idea of the way things were in the past and romanticized things. And he was actually part of the romantic art movement that valued like emotion and expression over the realistic portrayal of things. And I see a lot of these traits in Franklin. You know, he's trying to make short-term decisions to like fix these problems. He gives Jonathan money for bail and pays for a lawyer and has apparently lent him money in the past despite not liking him because he's just trying to like help Grace in the short term. And maybe he helped with the Elena problem, who knows? But let's like quickly go to the idea of like the port as a symbol for a second. Like it's a place that represents the coming and going of people and like movement and like constant change. And despite all this like hustle and bustle and like busyness going on, what's overwhelming is the light from the sun. The sunlight is bigger than everything going on and all these man-made structures and like all of this activity. It's all encompassing and overwhelming, especially the way Turner painted it. Like he painted 
painted it to be like that blinding and bright. You know, maybe the light symbolizes goodness or the truth, or maybe Grace is blinded by the light. Like the light of Jonathan, like his vibrancy, and it's blinding her to like all these other truths that she's unwilling to see and she's blocking out. But I think a key theme of this painting is that whatever this light is, it's inevitable that it will just dominate and overpower everything. And light is more powerful than humans and will be here long after all the humans in the painting and the show will die. Sorry, that got dark. But I mean, the show's dark and the way it's shot is dark in general. Like it's very moody and like film noir, but it also feels like very like dreamlike or nightmare-like. You know, I've noticed it's been like a recurring theme where like a lot of these shots are like very crystal clear and sharp in one portion, but then like other parts of it will be like very hazy and blurry and kind of like hard to make out. Just like this painting. No, but like really, Turner was known for creating these massive compositions and a lot of it was very like atmospheric and like hazy and blurry and like hard to really see these details. But then on the other hand, like parts of it is like super detailed and precise and like very clear. So he combines these two different types of styles. And then tying it way back to the opening song of the show, you know, Dream a Little Dream of Me, it's kind of like this overall vibe of like not being able to tell the difference between like what's dreamy and what's in your mind and like what's actually reality. And even as viewers, we aren't entirely sure like what's real. We don't know who to trust either. And whenever Grace has these like very vivid daydreams or like episodes, I'm not really sure what to call them. Those shots are like very hazy and blurry. I just love that like from the way the show is shot to Grace's flashbacks to this painting, like they all kind of like live in the same universe of like being a little bit hazy and blurred and dreamlike. But why does Franklin keep coming back to this painting? Do we think Franklin is finally confronting the reality that all of this is way bigger than him? Does he like it because the painting is calming and loves the warm colors? And maybe he's all about like the golden hour vibe. Or maybe he's scared of the future and he wants things to stay as they were in the past. Maybe he just likes how the painting literally looks. Maybe he actually relates to and identifies with the artist. Or just maybe the bench is super comfortable and has memory foam cushions and he loves sitting there. I mean, I doubt it. I've never been to a museum with a comfy bench. Also, another thing I noticed was the Frick collection itself. It's one of New York's last Gilded Age mansions. I googled the Gilded Age because I forgot what it was. I'm so sorry to all of my high school history teachers, but it was from like the 1870s to the 1900s. And one of the first things that came up was something that Mark Twain had said about it. He called this time period the Gilded Age because on the surface, everything was glowing and glittering with economic growth and prosperity. But beneath that surface was really corrupt. And yeah, so I see that theme as just like a big parallel to like these rich, wealthy families of Reardon. Everything looks like rich and fancy on the outside and perfect. And maybe right below that surface is just like a lot of darkness, which we're already kind of seeing. And then kind of going back to the artist Turner, I read a lot of places online that maybe his last words were, the sun is God. I'm not sure how much I believe this. Like it seems a little bit too convenient. Like he was a grumpy dude. I don't think he's being that poetic on his deathbed. Thought I'd still mention it because it does show how obsessed he was with light. That was a lot. Are you guys still here with me? <laughs> I tried my best to focus on stuff that I thought was really important to the storyline or maybe gave us a few clues about what happened to Elena. Um, but of course, like, you know, I probably left some stuff out, but hopefully nothing too important. You know, I couldn't cover every single artwork in the show, even though I would have loved to, but also like that might have taken like hours and hours and hours. Um, although I do want to mention that the high powered attorney, Haley Fitzgerald, she has some like really cool artwork in her office that I noticed. Like she has like this, like very like geometric abstract print. And then she also has this like Basquiat themed artwork in there. Like, I don't know. Like I feel like she has a really cool office and like really great style. So is there info that Franklin has that Grace doesn't know, but then she'll find out and she'll think it helped Jonathan, but it'll eventually doom the both of them and lead to their undoing. Did Jonathan actually kill Elena with help? Maybe Franklin? Maybe someone else? Or are Grace's daydreams actually memories and we'll find out later that she's actually involved? 
Is Henry just like really sharp and a little bit weird? Or is he involved? I really hope not though, like please. Also, I do know this is based on a book, but I've chosen not to read anything extra about it because I want to be surprised and come up with guesses and not spoil it for myself. So yes, I could be reading way too deeply into this artwork and you guys may think I'm crazy, but I also don't believe in a production like this, decisions to shoot and frame certain artwork repeatedly were random. Like, I don't know, I just can't believe that all this was like purely coincidental. I mean, that would be amazing and I'm just like finding parallels, but like, I just don't think that's the case. Like, I do think that the art is trying to give us hints or clues or like themes about things. Guys, just let me please justify my art history degree for like once. So yes, let me know in the comments what you guys think. Who do you think killed Elena? Or like, have any of your thoughts or opinions on the show changed after learning a bit more about these symbols in art? I don't think I have a clear theory myself. Maybe I'll go with the violin teacher, Mr. Rosenbaum. I don't know what to think. I My brain's gonna explode. That's the video. Um, thank you so much for watching if you watched through this entire thing. And I'll see you really soon because I will make um, another video for the last two episodes. Ah! Okay, that's it. Um, yeah, thanks again and see you soon. Bye.